Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let us pray. Oh, Lord in heaven, holy is your name, Lord, and may your name be glorified and counted holy on earth just like it is in heaven. You voluntarily, for a test for all of us, for one thing, but also to prove to the enemy that he's never been a contender against you. Hallelujah. Uh, in his deception, he lies and, and uh, he lies to himself. And so you allow this thing to go on. Uh, you belong, or rather this world belongs to you. Everything you've created, we belong to you. We all owe you. Saint and sinner alike is in debt to you. And we thank you so much for Christ Jesus your one and only true Son who died on the cross for our sins. Hallelujah. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for loving us to do that. And thank you for then sending uh, that Son and yourself. You both abide in us um, in several parts of Scripture. Hallelujah. Greater is, are you who is in us than he that's in the world. We'll discuss that today, Lord. Give us information, insight, uh, as you would have each one of us, as you know we need individually. Uh, let us know that you're here. Show up. Uh, and wherever two or three are gathered, your word says that you're there. But I don't mind telling you, we want you to be there more obviously. And I'm not looking for signs or wonders because that's not biblical. But I am looking for a seriousness that we've never had before when we get together concerning you and your name, Lord. Help us in that endeavor. Pray for Pastor Eric and Hannah and Caitlin. And, uh, and of course, there are others, but Hannah and Caitlin in particular, Lord, you are the only one who can cause a change in the change that you know they need. So we ask for that, Lord. We ask for healing. We ask for uh, health, spiritually and otherwise, for all the rest of us as well. We pray for all the true Christians in the world, Lord, who are being systematically more and more shoved aside, buried, nullified in the eyes of the world. And yet we have the kingdom. Hallelujah. Yet we have everything that you have, and you have everything. You are the creator. We are joint heirs with Christ. Hallelujah. What a status. Never let us forget that, Lord. Forgive us our sins. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Well, uh, 1 John 4.4. 4. Go there with me, please. Which is a title. Uh, I actually preached this on September 11th, 2016. But you all need to hear it again. It's only been almost three years. <laughs> 1 John. The letter of John as opposed to the gospel of John. Chapter 4, verse 4. In fact, I'm going to read down from 1 because I want to give context. Beloved, verse 1, chapter 4. Do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. See, just by saying this, the very first verse is talking about testing people. Because we're talking about testing those who speak God's word, supposedly. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, the false teachers, the bad spirits. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Hallelujah. Well... You know, this is a scripture that I hung to big time way back when I first got saved because I, I, was, uh, I got justified, but I needed the assurance that God was on my side for real. You know, when you first come and you're a baby, you need milk. If you're 90 years old and you first come to the Lord, you need milk. And so, 
I was, I guess, still in my milk days. I might have graduated to, you know, cream of wheat or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I was basically a milk guy, like we all were at the very beginning. But that was nearly 30 years ago, hallelujah. And I'm, you know, I've grown up and uh, I've always been serious with God's word, but never more than, than today, I can say. So many try to imagine that God is somehow with us, but the question of how keeps them somewhat guessing. And it is a legitimate question. In fact, Josie asked me that question uh, either that time, th that long ago, or a little bit sooner than that. And I, I, we included it in one of the newsletters, and of course, by the Spirit is how he does it. More than that is hard to explain, isn't it? But by the Spirit is how he does that. She asked how can God live in us, and uh, it, was, it was really similar to Nicodemus, a grown-up, a teacher of the law, asking Jesus, can a man go back in his mother's womb? You see, it was sort of like that. He was thinking totally spiritual. So Josie's already thinking like Nicodemus. <laughs> but Nicodemus came to be a believer. I believe that with all my heart because he hung there and, and, uh, and he spoke up um, for Jesus uh, whenever he could. And church history bears that out as well. And so, but we have this God living in us. Uh, J.B. Phillips says, and he translated uh, 1 John 4, 4 this way. And I quote, because the one who lives in you is far stronger than the Antichrist in the world. It's another way of saying the same thing, but I think a little bit more explanatory to our way of thinking today. It's this phenomena that God actually makes his home in every true believer. That is astounding all by itself. But more than that, a real fact of this earthly life for the true believer. Isn't that amazing? If you're saved, God is living in you. I'm looking at the Spirit of God that's in you. And this is why it's such a blasphemy when uh, uh, Robinson, uh, uh, what's it? forget his name now, he's got a TV show, he's had a TV show for a long time. No, 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 not oral. Uh, oh, what's his, anyway, he and his wife have a show, I forget his name now, but he says when he looks at the current Pope, he sees Jesus. Pat Robinson? No, not Pat Robinson. Uh, anyway, how can he look at a man who look, prayed to a little doll about this big, and you know, all this stuff in, in uh, the office of Pope, you can't possibly see Jesus there, it's, it's, it's a lie. And so, but when people, the more and more people are doing this, and uh, including Kenneth Copeland and others, lays his hands on the Pope's chest. You've got to be pretty tight spiritually with the, with the Pope to be able to do that. And so all these people who are claiming evangelicalism are, have fallen off the wagon, as it were, and we have this sort of thing going on. But despite all that, despite the spirit of Antichrist all around us, God lives in us. Amen. See, that's the thing. And I'm going to talk about 5G next Sunday. It's a scary thing, the scariest I've ever read about. But Christ Jesus lives in me, so I don't have to be that scared. I mean, things will come. But greater is He who is in me than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. See, there's a reason God put these scriptures in there. And it pertains to us in the last of the last days more than ever before. And John 14, 16, and 17 makes the promise, and God cannot lie, that God will be in us true believers. Go to John 14 with me. The Gospel of John this time. Gospel 14. Same author. John 14, 16. Jesus is speaking. One of the ones that's in you is speaking. And he says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but will know him, or but you rather know him, and he dwells with you and will be in you. 
At this time, he was dwelling, dwelling with them, but he wasn't in them until you get to John 22, where, where Jesus breathed on his disciples to give them the Holy Spirit. Mm. Is there any doubt that God will be in the believer? Not according to his word. If there's a doubt in your mind, you got a problem because his word says it is. Since the God, or rather since God is the Spirit, and since we received our lives from Him when He breathed us into Adam, it is reasonable to conclude that it is the spirit part of our total being in which God resides as opposed to our flesh or our soul even, which is our mind, will, and emotions. He should be all over our mind because our mind is what makes the decisions about what we do the very next moment or sometime in the future. And if we're led by the Spirit of God, if God has a hold of our spirits, and we say, okay, I want to do that, but Lord, is that what I want to do? Really? Because what I want to do is please you. And if you're not pleased, or if this is going to lead to some catastrophe for me, then I don't want to do it. Spare me that problem. And then you stay calm, cool, and collected. And God will give you the answer and you go on. But many times we don't do that. Many times we're already on the thing we want to do. And we may say, oh Lord, if this ain't right, do it anyway. We know of a family member, maybe two of them, who had married somebody and uh, wanted God to, that didn't work out, and wanted God, while they were in, in the running towards the marriage, wanting God to stop it if it wasn't right. Well, he wasn't going to do that because you were running towards it. <laughs> See, we want God to, to slap us and say, don't go that far. And what he rather does is he guides you. He channels you. You know why? Because sometimes we need that fall to wake up. This is how we learn. Who ever learned from a success? Nobody. You learn from a mistake. In verse 21 of 14, we have the wonderful assurance that the Father would love those who keep Jesus' commands. Woo! Verse 23 then sort of clinches the fact that they both, Father and Son, would live in the believer. And by the way, let me go back there, John 14. Yeah, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Woo, so loving God doesn't have to do with, I just want to hug Jesus. It means obeying him. Saul didn't obey, and Samuel said, obedience is better than sacrifice. Yeah, but I kept these animals alive, you know, and I'm going to, the best ones, I'm going to sacrifice them to God. I'm going to whack them all. And God says, no, you kill every animal. I don't want to sacrifice them that group. But Saul thought he knew better. So he disobeyed. We do this a lot. We're just like Saul. Saul was anointed and appointed to be king. And was king. And God gave him victory. And yet he does this. He who has my commandments and keeps them. It's not about having them. It's not about knowing. It's about doing. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. And by the way, in the Greek, that is, and will be loved, and only those will be loved by my Father. It's very distinct in the Greek. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Yourself, or, uh, and then 24, he who does not love me does not keep my words. Mm. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Mm. See, this is, you go right to the Father. With Jesus, you go right to the, if you believe Jesus, you automatically believe in the Father because he always did what the Father said. And he only spoke what the Father told him to say. That's pretty clear scripture. And yet people screw around with that right and left. And I'm not here standing before you saying that, oh yeah, I'm, I'm this guy right here, I just obey so much and I just love God. I am working on it.
just like you all are working on it. But the, every time I get it right, I know it. Every time I get it wrong, I know it. <laughs> uh, and that's where the wisdom of God then comes in. Verse 26, we're informed that the Father also sent the Holy Spirit to come into us, teach us all things that we need to know and bring us to remember the words of Christ. You know, this is why Jesus said in another place, don't call anyone rabbi. Rabbi means, oh, exalted one. Or exalted teacher. doesn't just mean teacher. It means, oh, exalted teacher. And you have people going around, not stopping people, calling them rabbi this and rabbi that. Jonathan Kahn is one of them. In many ways, his last name fits. He spells it C-A-H-N, but it could be C-O-N just as easy. <laughs> you don't do that. The prayer shawl, that whole business, and John Hagee, you know, it's just getting worse and worse and worse. The Holy Spirit was the promise Jesus made to his disciples. At Pentecost, the promise was fulfilled. Hallelujah. They were empowered by the Holy Ghost just as promised. They were born again in Acts 20, 22, somewhere in there, when he breathed on them. That's when the disciples were born again. But they didn't have the dunamis, where we get dynamite, right? Er, that power to say yes to Jesus in the face of all kinds of trouble. And to say, you know what, you're not teaching the Word of God because here's what it says. I have a copy, and I know how to read it, and here's what it says. I know how to understand it. And you're not doing that. If you believe that God used evolution to make things, you don't believe this word. And many other things. And if you don't believe that, you can't believe the, if you don't believe the beginning, you can't believe the end or anything in the middle. You can't do it. Let's go again quickly to John chapter 5. I'm going to drive this home because... Uh, no, it's 6. I mean, I mean it, it, it is 5. Let's start, let's start with 39. The Pharisees, the unbelievers, are arguing with Jesus. And Jesus is speaking. He says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing. You are not willing. You are not willing. You are not willing. You are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Not like he's not going to give it to them. But they're not willing. Verse 41, I do not receive honor from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. Whoa. Meaning, you're not obeying God. Because to love God is to obey him. We just read it, right? Verse 43, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. I'm the one you read about. I'm the Savior that talks about it, and yet you don't believe me. You don't receive it. If another comes in his own name, which will be the Antichrist, him you will receive. Just like Daniel said, you're going to make a seven-year deal. How can you believe who receives honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Verse 45, Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. In other words, the Pentateuch accuses you. The first five books of the Bible, which Moses wrote. Verse 46, For if you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, which includes creation, how will you believe my words? Well, the thing is, the answer is you can't. If you don't believe the beginning... You can't believe the end or the middle. You can't do it. Jesus just said you can't do it. And the New Testament is inspired commentary on the Old Testament. There's nothing in the New that isn't already in the Old. Some of it veiled, like the church was veiled. We study it in Bible study, right? But it wasn't unknown. The gospel was taught to Abraham before the law. Paul tells us the gospel was taught to Abraham. The New Testament was taught to Abraham. Wow. I love it. Greater is he who is in you than he that's in the world. To 
To have this power, of course, is to have all we need to be witnesses for Christ. And all true believers have this power, by the way. And it's not to be confused with spiritual gifts. That's a different thing Paul talks about in Corinthians. This is the power in you to have faith in God and to stay there if you at all have any gumption to. It's your choice whether you stay. It's your choice whether you come. It's your choice whether you stay. It's also your choice if you decide to leave. Well, you can't do that. Well, not according to this. Remember that you have to be able to prove your faith. Everything in time takes time. James says, you need to show me your faith. You say, you got faith, show it to me. In fact, show it to yourself. Prove to yourself that you got a believer. Paul tells us in Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians, last thing, uh, 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 make sure that you're in the faith. Check for yourselves. Don't let me do it. It's not my job. I am here to judge you because you got to judge me, I got to judge you. Us inside, we inside the church, we judge one another. It's outside the church we don't judge because they're already judged. What's the point? Once somebody says they're in the church, then we got to judge them by what they do, what they say, and how they act, of course. That's what this is. And people don't want to accept that. Oh, no, don't judge me. Christians don't judge if they're in love. Well, the Bible says that's exactly what you do when you're in love. Because when you're in love, you obey. And what do you obey? You obey the Word of God. I, I'm amazed at how many things are messed up. Uh, not that, that I'm not amazed that they're messed up because we, we were told they would be, but I'm amazed at how many people are so willingly befudgimicated by it. <laughs> That's just a new word I made up. Put that in the book. <laughs> they just really just eat it up. It's like they never go any further. It's like, what? You guys need to know that what I say is in here. Not only by word, you know, believe in God. Not only those words, but what those words mean in context. Is he telling us the truth? That's what this is all about. So don't confuse the power of God with the gift of God, which is a whole, it involves the power, of course, too. But not everyone is a prophet. Not everyone speaks in tongues. Not everyone is a healer, you know, like Paul was telling us. <clears throat> So we can say that uh, the part that it is part of the completion, the complete rather salvation package given freely by God and gratefully received by all true believers. Something given is nothing until it's received. You can't receive that which isn't offered to be given. <laughs> they go together, two sides of one coin, forgiveness and repentance. You can forgive all day long, but if the person never repented, they're still with that sin. It's all for me because I forgave them, but it's still on them if they don't repent. You understand? You can't have one without the other. What's the point? Well, God forgave everybody, so everybody's saved. Has everybody repented? That's the question. No, they haven't. You've got to have both. Just like sin without a sinner has no job, forgiveness without repentance has no job. What's it going to do? Forgive what? Oh, we'll forgive the sin. <laughs> yeah, but it's still alive as sin. It hasn't been repented of. Oh, you got to have them both. So we need this power to make it through life, this Holy Spirit this God and the Father and the Spirit living in us. But we need to do it in a way that honors Him, don't we? And this is where we need to check ourselves. And I'm chief sinner up here telling you, I have never told you anything that I myself do, am not battling. Ever. And will continue till I kick the proverbial bucket. Yet when I laid in that hospital room, I had no problem going to be home with Jesus because I, I, know, I, know, I know I'm going there. And it's not some, you know, weird. I've said this many times. I believe I'm going there not because I believe it, but because I believe him who said if I believe him, I'm going there. That's what it is. Because it's not mine. Because otherwise it would be mine. You understand? It would be mine. And this is what the word faith and other false teachers teach. Oh, it's your faith. It's a force that you make happen. If you believe it enough, it'll happen. You know, 
And then, of course, they sell it by believe to have the Cadillac, believe to have the plane, believe to have this. <coughs> Yet they go to the hospital all the time. All the time. They had cancer and stuff too, all the big ones. And, or their wives or somebody did. And they go to the hospital. There's nobody, you know. <coughs> I remember Billy Joe Doherty made fun of people who had what he called weak faith, uh, you know, believing in someone's healing, and then he kicks the bucket at 50-something. Totally unexpected. Where was his faith there? Where were all those around him? He was a big preacher, started hundreds of churches in Eastern Europe and Russia back when that thing all broke up, you know, after the wall in 1990. I hope he made it. He was a nice guy. I think he was serious in what he believed, but he had some false stuff for sure. Only God knows. Jesus by obedience to the law. In other words, what was written to doctrine. This is why Paul pushes doctrine. The 22 times, 21 or 22 times, doctrine is mentioned in the Bible. 19 is mentioned in 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus. Because those are the, uh, the pastoral letters. Okay, Timothy, here's how you do this. Okay, Titus, here's how you do this. Here's how you anoint the elders, you know, so forth and so on in church. Because it's about doctrine. And what does the New Age say? Eckhart Tolle and Oprah and all the rest of them say, Oh, no, it's not dogma. That's like, ooh. It's about feeling. It's exactly what they teach. It's about how you feel. The exact opposite of God's word. So Jesus obeyed by obedient, by being obedient to what was written. How did he come against the temptation against Satan when he tried to tempt him? He said, it is written. In fact, Satan started off, it is written, you know. And Jesus said, yeah, but it's also written, you know. So, so you can't take this, make a story up, and say that's scripture. It's got to drive with everything else. And Jesus, of course, knew that, and he had to flee because he had nothing. He's got nothing today. He's got nothing on you and me. He never did. And wherever you and I are weak, we freely give it to this enemy of God, this enemy of truth, this enemy of life and love and everything else. He just as soon see to it that Moose never had an eighth birthday. That's how hateful he is. He wanted to knock me away from having my 66th. But, ow! Not yet. <coughs> Go to Galatians 3, please. Galatians 3. Just before Ephesians and after Corinthians. Are you hearing me? Yes. Are you hearing God? Yes. 3.10 and following. Are you there? Shout, Ow! For as many as are the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. When Luther read this and his, when he was translating, it set him free. This one line set him free. He was still, yeah, but you know, am I right, God? Is this right? What I'm, I know that I feel like th this, is, this is right and all the Catholic stuff is wrong and I feel like, and, and he couldn't get over that hump until he read this. I had similar things with different scriptures and I'm sure you all have too. There's something in the scripture that just says, bang, that's it. From now on, no more doubt about that thing. You see, you have to get to that point. Praise God. The just shall live by faith. Yet this law is not of faith, or rather, yet this law, yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. Why? Let's read it, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. What was the promise? That there is a Savior coming. He taught the gospel to Abraham, remember? Mm -hmm. 
This was the promise to Abraham. The gospel was the promise to Abraham. Abraham knew a Savior is coming from my loins. is way down the road. But I believe in that because you said it. I believe in that. <laughs> See, this is why Abraham is a, a father of faith. Yeah. He's the father of faith for anyone who believes in God. Jew, Gentile, or Martian, if there were such a thing. doesn't matter. If there's any life anywhere in the created universe, because that's all there is, Jesus is their Savior. And if he's not, they're going to the lake of far. <laughs> Greater is he who is in you than he that's in the world. Jesus was obedient to the law because he loved God. He loved his Father. This is why the believer can be indwelled by the Holy Spirit now once again as at the gar first in the garden. I believe they actually glowed. This is how the animals knew that they were not just animals. They glowed with the Spirit of God and it was gone after the fall. It just left them. They were no longer glowing. And so they had to go, you know, put the old supposed fig leaves and all that, try to justify their sin, self-justification. And God says, that won't work. So he killed two animals and he shed the first blood. He said, this won't do it forever, but it'll do it. It'll satisfy me for now because life is in the blood, you sinned, etc. So God killed the first two animals, gave them the skins to wear to cover up their nakedness because they were now no longer glowing, if you will, with the presence of God. Moses' face was glowing. This is how I know they were glowing. And it was glowing so much so that they went, go back up there and talk to him because we're too afraid. Moses had to veil his face. Mm. Wow. The veil had to come before the Holy of Holies and the people could never see it. Only the priest got in here once a year at that. God's glory is too much for those who are unsafe. Sin can't be in the presence of God. It'll get whacked immediately, if not sooner. I'm not saying I've arrived, but I, my level of understanding has increased over the years as to the holiness of God. And so that being the case, I have to wonder for myself, why am I still doing some of the stupid things I do, especially with my thoughts and my mouth? Amen. I mean, I get this. I, I get it. I, got, I get the holiness more than last year and certainly 20-some years ago. And yet, and like Paul, who certainly would have gotten it, I can say, who's going to set me free from this? Ow! <laughs> Jesus Christ who paid my price. See, that's the thing. <coughs> when Paul was doing the things he didn't want to do and didn't do the things he wanted to do, Christ was still in him, just like he is with you and me and any other believer. When we get saved... The safe person who is and stays in faith is separated from his flesh, sort of. I don't know how else to say it. Because we still sin. Because if we weren't separated spiritually in the way that I speak, and I don't know what else to say about it in terms of explaining it, because I, don't, I, don't, I just don't have the words, then every time we sin, we'd have to lose our salvation. You see, but that's not true. Paul says, I discover a law within me. Yeah. Where the sin is warring against the flesh and the spirit or the spirit through the flesh and I'm not able to really overcome it so what do I do I look to Christ who did overcome it he lived a life to qualify for the cross Hebrews tells us he could have never went on the cross if Christ would have sinned even one time even had a thought of sinning you, you, oh, that's so far from me because I want payback yesterday Although I know God is the one that's going to do it ultimately and for real. And no one can do it any better. Mm -hmm. Everyone will get exactly what they deserve. The justice of God is amazing. Mm -hmm. It is right on point, as we you know, would say. There is no, well, you kind of, you know, well, you should. No! Bang! Right on point. Bullseye, right in the middle. And that's where sin comes in. Sin is missing that mark. God don't miss that mark as he can't sin. He not only doesn't sin, he can't sin. Now Christ had the possibility of sinning. Why? He became flesh. And this is why Paul says he didn't become a man. He became flesh. 
He wanted the world to know, and those who were already teaching that, flesh is bad and spirit is good. You cannot possibly have God showing up in flesh. They didn't believe Christ. And this is why Paul or John says, that person is an antichrist, yeah. because he did come in the flesh, because he can do it. If he hadn't come in the flesh, you and I would still be dead in our sins. He could not have been proven. Mm -hmm. And God would have been still justified. Because you can't take his justification. Sin is sin and God is God, you see. But God said, I'm going to do this just to show you, Satan, that you're so far below. You're not even a comparison, which people think there is. People think, you know, they're both fighting it out. Who's going to win? All this nonsense. No, no, no. God's God, holy. Satan's already lost. He lost from day one. He lost before he ever got created. He's just a loser. He's a liar and a loser. And that's just a fact. But that's what there's a God can do this. But yet, he could have just said, away with you. And that would have been fine. Who's going to say anything? Who's going to come against God? You know, I'm not. Neither is anybody else. But he said, no, because I'm God, I'm totally just. And that justice cannot be perverted. So even for me to get this done, to get this sin stain off of you all, whom I love, I you, my creation, in my image. How can I do this? I know I can do this. I'll pay the price myself. Ooh. And he speaks the word. Mary gets impregnated. A human body comes out of that. The father of that child is the father, the creator of all. That's what this is. This is why when somebody, when the Catholics talk about Mary, that's not the Mary. They got a devil called Mary. That's not the Mary. Because the Mary said, oh, I was a sinner. And the, and the Catholics say, oh no, she's, she's co-redemptrix with Christ. The blasphemy, see, pe most people don't understand how far the blasphemy of all the isms are. Hinduism, Buddhism, Catholicism, ism, ism, ism. These isms are evil. And you only have to be evil a little bit to be totally evil. You only have to screw up a little bit of faith to ruin it all. A little leaven leavens the whole bunch. Not a lot of leaven, a little leaven. Don't let any leaven get in your life. I know it's going to get in there, just like it does me. But the moment it does, you fight it and you tell it to get away from you. And I don't mean in that stupid television preacher mentality. Lord, rebuke this. Lord, rebuke this. Lord, rebuke this. And he will. I got a text singing a song here this morning. And I had to stop the verse for myself standing right here in front of you all, and I had to say, Lord, rebuke that. And it was gone. Maybe it was for this bringing it out before you. I know it works for me. You don't tell the thing to go away because the thing don't listen to you. It doesn't have to. Whether it's a devil, whether it's whatever it is, it doesn't have to. But if you put the Lord in there, they have to go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sin cannot stand to be around God. Mm. So Jesus was obedient to the law. The visible glory of God was on Jesus. He spoke like no one's ever spoken. Who is this man, everybody said, right? Who is this man? Even the disciples, time and time again, you know, Thomas, and then on the boat and everywhere else. Wow, who is this man? Ah, the storm, the storm. Who is this man? Who is walking on the water? Is that even possible? Who is this man? Always, who is this man? Who is this man? Who is this man? Who is this man? And the Pharisee said, who are you? And he said, I'm the guy that you're reading about in Moses, but you don't believe that. And I proved it. In fact, in another place he says, okay, don't believe me, but believe me because of the things I do, the works I do. I raise the dead, I heal the sick, I cast out devils, etc., etc. Because only I can do that. Only God's Son can do that. Only God can do that. Believe me for that reason. But they wouldn't even do that. To this day. Even the Orthodox Jews who are right about the Zionists, who are fake Jews, are still wrong about Christ. They're still going to the lake of fire if they don't repent. But I do believe during the last days and the remnant will be these guys because they're the ones who are seeking. You see what I'm saying? They're not there because they don't believe Christ, but they're seeking. They're going to get a clue when Christ comes back and dips his clothing in blood, the winepress of trampling all the sinners. 
Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the... That's what the song's all about. He's stomping out the grapes of wrath. Not of love, of wrath. Which, of course, is love because it's righteous wrath. You understand? You can't have wrath unrighteous not being... I mean, unrighteous being love. It's got to be righteous wrath. They deserve it. There's a guy in Mumbai, I believe it was. He's trying to sue his parents for giving him birth. He says he didn't have a, he didn't have a, uh, a choice, and he also concedes and says that well because it's not possible to have that choice before birth because you're not here, <laughs> uh, you shouldn't have any kids at all, ever. You see, this guy's a businessman. He's not some low life over there. He's a, you know, he knows stuff. You know, he knows math and he can read. You know what I mean? He's not an unintelligent person. But look where the idiocy goes to, and with all this other stuff that we're dealing with. I, I knew it would get ugly, but I didn't know it would get so stupid. You know, ugly is one thing, but stupid, because you can understand that. You can understand a rational enemy. You can understand a rational rapist. What's the point? He wants to rape. What's the thief's point? He wants to rob a bank. You can understand that. They're wrong. They need to be punished, but you can understand it. But you can't understand this nonsense. No. It's too crazy. It's called an irrational enemy. And that's what we have. That goes back to Babylon, which is what? Confusion. Confusion cannot possibly be rational. Oh, man, this is crazy. Faith in God and his gospel makes us clean. We sing about it in many ways, right? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Woo, woo. Are you? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So this new life in Christ has its beginning in the fact that God gave us the spark that broke the yoke which held us bound to self and the world. See, you're a child of God because you got there by the new birth. But you're a creation of God before the new birth. And you were made in His image. So there's a life of God is in everybody. However... Ephesians 2.1 tells us we were dead in our trespasses and sins. So we weren't dead as humans because we were still his creation, but we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And that spark that overcomes that, the original sin basically, is what Christ has to do. And he does it when you're seeking him. This is why somebody that doesn't really get this or that just sort of feels bad about their drug use and they're fornicating or whatever, and they come forward because some preacher says, oh, come on, you know, Lord Jesus, come into my life, blah, blah, blah. That's great. But if it doesn't have the conviction of God, you are a sinner and you're going to the lake of fire. Don't even walk up there. Saying those words is nothing. That prayer was invented in the 1940s and 50s by Billy Graham and others, and Billy Holiday and some others, to try to get people to you know, go for God. They had, a, they had a righteous thought about that. I, I totally believe that. But the whole thing doesn't work because it's not biblical. You come to God when Jesus Christ in your spirit says, you know what, I'm a sinner and I need to repent. Just like I had to do. Nobody's any different. Once one receives forgiveness from sins through faith in Christ, we're made alive in the Spirit, which, because of the disconnect caused by original sin, were for a time dead in our trespasses and sins. There was a disconnect. That's what it was. When Adam and Eve sinned, they, they unplugged us. That's why their light went out. Good way to look at it. But we still had enough plug in us <laughs> to be able to be plugged back in. See? And that's the new birth experience. You can't do it any other way. It's a spiritual rebirth. God lives in us by the Spirit. He who is in the world is nowhere greater than the one who is in you. Woo! So this being made alive is because the very one that is life Think about this. Are you hearing me? The very one that doesn't just have it, but is life, has now made his home in us. He is the greater one. Our faith in God is the binder in this relationship. No faith, no, no residence for Christ. He's not going to live in an unbeliever. He can't. It's not even possible. Totally not possible. 
What are you saying? You can't come in and help me? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying because the Bible says it. You get born again, you're in. If that spark that's still there gets fired up by Christ, then why would it get fired up? Because you're seeking and you're searching with all your heart. And God says in another place, Old Testament as well, if you seek and search me with what? All your heart, you will what? Find me. There's no not finding God if you're really searching. Now, if you're searching to understand what God is and then you're going to play with him, you're never going to find him. That's where these, you know, f uh, philosophers are. David Bolt says uh, in a book he wrote called Of Heaven and Hope, quote, it is totally unrealistic to assume that there is no adversary, no sower of doubts and fears, no tempter to corrupt our best endeavors. It is only, listen to me, it is only when we are going more or less in the same direction as the devil that we are unconscious of any opposition at all. <coughs> Someone like Oprah is totally unconscious of her position. She, because she's walking right along with him and in fact saying, come on devil, you're lagging behind. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's that bad. And all these other guys. I mean, when I see your interviews, I just recently saw a bunch of them from the past and some current, more current ones. I mean, she's into it. You can't say she doesn't believe because she does. She believes that probably more than most of us believe something good. <coughs> I spoke about Satan and why he was created and everything. We're going to take him apart in Bible study. The newsletter I did years ago on Satan... Uh, <coughs> His abode now, his abode where it will be, and all his titles, all his, uh, everything about him, everything about him we're going to discuss because we must know our enemy. And while we've gone through it, and I handed out the newsletter years ago, I feel like we need to redo it in Bible study. We're going to do that starting Wednesday. We're going to get with it and take him apart so we know exactly who we're dealing with. He is the enemy of all that is holy, just, and right. In fact, the devil is the enemy of life himself. Jesus said that he himself is life. And the name El, like El Elyon and El Shaddai and so forth, means the self-existing one. Mm. I love it. We must all first enter into the Christian life by faith in Christ in order to begin to live by faith. No one, oh, oh I live in faith, oh, I believe Jesus. No, if you're not born again, it's not even possible. Messed up my paperwork here. <clears throat> the greater one, God, is surely in us <clears throat> with more reality than we know. Because we're always looking for an explanation, aren't we? We're always looking for something that we can wrap our minds around. We can read the scriptures in 1 John that proves this fact, and the scriptures prove it. Why? It's about doctrine. Timothy, it's doctrine. Titus, it's doctrine. All you pastors preach doctrine. All you believers believe doctrine. It's doctrine, 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 and more doctrine. Doctrine means right teaching. That's what the word means. And so that's what we have to have. It is from this point on that we are to live a brand new life, a life in Christ who is personally within us to aid in any way needed. J.B. Phillips says, not only, oh, listen to me, not only has God become man and lived life on human terms, not only has God reconciled man to himself by a personal act, not only has God proved that death is conquered by an unforgettable demonstration of power, but God lives in the man who personally, that is he himself, is open to him. Life is a matter not of conforming to external rules or religion, but of being transformed from within. Paul was being transformed from within until his race was over. And he said, I kept the faith. I run my race. Let's make sure you keep your faith and I keep mine as we're running our particular race. Keep it. The process needs to be that... For some, this is very painful because of breakup of old ways and thinking and new responsibilities. I can't take it. And the checking of our priorities. Oh, I want to do this, though. I haven't been to Florida in I don't know how long. I really want to go. 
you know, this is what we do. And uh, I just really want to be comfortable. I want to be healthy and comfortable and a little wealth wouldn't hurt. Well, God says none of those things hurt either. I want those for you. But don't get them through the world's way. Don't get them because you just want it. Because then you're not obviously thinking of me. Look what I did for you. I left my wealth. I left my godhood. I left it. Jesus never healed anybody, raised anybody from the dead, or cast out devils because he was God. He did it as a man, listening to God who told him to do certain things to certain people and with certain people. That's the thing. There's no way that Jesus could have come to earth as God, without a body, that is, with not being man, and did the things and then paid for our prize. It's like, duh. You didn't even have to do all that. All you could do was just say the word. You could have ended it with Abraham, for that matter. No, man had to become, or rather God had to become a man all the way. Capable of being tempted. If he wasn't capable, the whole thing would have been shot. No value in Jesus if he wasn't capable of, of falling into sin. Because he wouldn't have been all flesh, for one. And God made him flesh, not just man. The word is sarx in the Greek. It means flesh. It means this. That's what it means. This right here. And the thing that drives this, the mind, you see. And he says, no, he didn't just become a man, he became flesh. He became weak. Because we're weak, the spirit is weak through what? The flesh. It feels good. I want to do it because it feels good. And if it feels good, how can it be so wrong? Because <laughs> it feels so right. And the music industry backs that up, and, the, and the, you know, Hollywood and all that stuff we talked about so many times, they back this stuff up, they back up the flesh, the flesh, the flesh. Comedians back this up. I love to laugh. I'm the funniest guy. I'm the king of fun. Everybody knows that that knows me, but not when it comes to the Word of God. I'm going to argue until I'm blue in the face, and I'm going to whatever if I need to. Now, again, I'm not going to do it silly like I used to. Because I've learned a thing or three. One of them is not all have faith, nor do they care, and not to cast my pearls. All has to do with wisdom, ladies and girls. For this reason, this priority thing, it was recognized that anyone who opens his personality, that is himself, the one who he is, his spirit, to the living God, takes the risk of being considerably shaken. Philip says, <laughs> if you haven't been considerably shaken, check your faith. I was shaken because I just thought I knew some stuff when I got saved. I was 38 or 9 years old when I got saved. I lived a pretty good chunk of my life as a heathen. A nice heathen, a likable heathen, had many friends, had a good life, you know, making money, paying my bills, keeping a job, all that stuff, raising the little one. But I was still a heathen. I was laughing at jokes I should have never laughed at. I was telling jokes I should have never told. You see, we labor and strive and pray as though Christianity were a difficult performance. Theoretically, we would agree that with the notion of the indwelling Christ. Oh yeah, it says so. Yeah, he, he lives in me. But most of us, for most of the time, act as though we didn't know that. <coughs> We have lost sight of the fact that Christ is in us, both willing and doing. Consequently, we lack that joy, confidence, and spontaneity which rightly belongs to the sons of God. I get it every, time, every chance I get. I get that joy, I tell you, because this joy I feel down in my soul. I know it is the power of the Holy Ghost. This joy I feel. I mean, there's a song like that, Walt Mills. <laughs> that's a good foot stomping song. I play that on a guitar, actually. Or well, I used to. <coughs> <laughs> you call you call that Numa guitar, air guitar. <laughs> Von Hugel has said, quote, if we, the true born again person, or rather we, the truly born again person, are not to think of the Holy Spirit and the human spirit, God and the soul, as two separate entities. God's Spirit works in closest association with ours. Go to Romans 8. The book of the Romans. Romans 8. Mm -hmm. 
das achte Kapitel der Romana. Chapitre 8. Let's start with verse uh, 20. Let's go to 19. Talking about creation. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Wow. The trees and the birds and the bees and all the animals are waiting for us to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him, God, who subjected it in hope. Hope is earnest expectation. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty or freedom of the children of God. See, the creation, every blade of grass, I've said it before, every tree, every animal, they're under the curse. And they won't be set free until we're recognized by when Christ comes back. We get raptured out of here, we come back and take over. Hallelujah. Verse 22, we, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. You mothers know what that is better than most of us. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. That would be the rapture. For we were saved in this hope. I thought we were saved by grace, through faith. Well, we are. But we're also saved in this hope because it ain't over until you kick the bucket. That's why you have to stay in faith. For we are saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. Earnest expectation that you can see is not earnest expectation. For why does one still have earnest expectation or hope for what he sees? When you see it, it's over. It's, it's done. It's here. I can see it. I don't have to hope for it. But if I can't see it yet, i got to hope for it because it's down the road. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. This is the Spirit of God that lives in you, does this in your stead, because you don't know what to pray. When it comes to these problems, I don't know what to pray. But when I pray, I get joined by the Holy Spirit. And whatever comes out of my mouth or from my thoughts, the Holy Spirit does that with groanings that can't even be uttered. Wow. And here's why. Uh, verse 27. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, the Holy Spirit. It's because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. That's why. When we pray and we're off in our prayer somewhere, immediately the Spirit in us, because He's God, directs it towards His will. Woo! From who, or then He goes on to about uh, whom He chose and so on, the predestination thing. Hallelujah! It makes the whole, this is another Phillips quote, I got a few more because I, I really think the, he hit it on the nail on the head. It makes a whole world of difference when we believe that God, the whole unimaginable power, love, and wisdom behind everything is not merely on our side, but actually at work in our hearts and minds. See, this is the difference between friendship and relationship. You may be a friend with God, like, you know, Moses was a friend of God and all this, but it, that means a lot more when, when the Scripture talks about that. But in today's mentality, what a friend is, is not quite the same, is it? Mm -hmm. He's not just on your side wanting you to be saved and good and, you know, go through life and all that, remaining in faith. He actually works towards that inside you. That's what this says. That's what we just read. He works, he labors and groans along with our spirit to get God's will done. Wow. It's amazing to me. It's amazing to me. The New Testament teaches authoritatively and with no pretensions that the mighty God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, is able to perform the greatest miracle of all, the transformation of human characters by the entrance of the love of God into their souls. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. I think that's a problem with Caitlin. That's a problem with Hannah. That's a problem with many people. What else am I going to say about it? I wish I could personally do something. 
but then it wouldn't be God. You understand what I'm saying? Let's not forget what I said about the week, this coming week. Let's concentrate on that. And uh, we'll have uh, Pastor Eric and those guys join us as well. Hallelujah. We're going to have Brian join us. I'm going to, and Jimbo, and all everybody who believes in the gospel of God and who claims to be a Christian that I believe is a Christian as well is going to be in on this with these people. And let's see if God will do something. He says to test him, doesn't he? He says to try him. Well, have you tried God lately? Have you put him to the test? He says, go ahead, test me. Now, his will is still number one, do you understand? So it's not like what we want, you know, he's just going to do. When God is in us, believers, as the New Testament declares, then love is in us. Of course, that comes part and parcel of his perfect justice and his never-ending mercy. All three work together. You can't have love without justice. You can't have justice without mercy, which goes back to love. They all work together. Praise his name. We must be careful not to understand his never-ending mercy to mean that there is a gullibility with God or that he overlooks most of our evil desires. He does not. On the contrary, his perfect justice is in place for just such occasions. Justice works in complete and unfailing harmony with God's love, which is first, of course, intelligent and not driven by some feeling nonsense. Got another quote here from Phillips, and I like this as well. His dealings with us is not some optional religious game. Mm. He is in deadly earnest, and he is intent on bringing many sons to glory. He is indeed all goodness and light, but he will show no more compunction towards the evil things that we have allowed to grow in our hearts than a human surgeon would to a malignant growth. He'll cut it out. He'll cut it out because it has to leave. It can't be in the sight of God. The men of old, he goes on, were hardly exaggerating when they said, our God is a consuming fire. What's he consumed? The sin in our lives. The testing of our works will be this fire. Will they stand? Did we build whatever we built on the foundation of Christ Jesus and his salvation at Calvary? Or did we build it on our own desire to have a big congregation and a big church and a lot of money and fame and all this? If we build it on that, it's going to burn up. It's worthless. But if we built it on Christ himself and what his will is, his revealed will, then we're going to get rewarded as much as we did went towards that goal. We get rewarded accordingly. Hallelujah. Now, as a believer, if we build bad, we're still saved. It has nothing to do with your salvation. It has to do with getting rewards. And it is true that the evil powers of today are temporary to this life. And that's why they are limited to this life. Hallelujah. Once we're glorified, it's over. There'll be no more sin in our lives. Not even a desire of a thought of sin. It's over. Are you still with me? Yes. We're almost done, almost, but not really. However, this fact does not give us the latitude to dismiss them as not being real in the here and now, these, this temporary evil, as is the habit of the contemporary world who falsely believe that they have apprehended some personal truth by reason of intelligence and learning. This cursed gnosis this trusting in acquired human knowledge, this is exactly what John faced and the rest of them, and John wrote against it by saying, he came, he became flesh, he became sarx, he became this. Because everyone around him, the Gnostics around him, were saying, oh no, God and flesh can never be together. Because one is one and sinful, it can never be right, and the spirit is holy, and it can never, you see, he said, that's not true. That's a pagan teaching. Casting all you care upon him, for he cares for you, 1 Peter 5, 7. The interpretation is that clearly God wants us to bear responsibility. However, when this responsibility gets to a state where anxiety because of it is overstated and thus overbearing, this bearing of whatever burden can be offloaded onto God because each one of us is his personal concern. Last little J.P. Phillips thing. Here's what he says in his new translation, which I personally really enjoy. J.B. Phillips says, quote, The word used for casting 
is an almost violent word, conveying the way in which a man at the end of his tether might throw aside an intolerable burden. And the Christian is recommended to throw this humanly insupportable weight upon the only one who can bear it, and at the same time to realize that God cares for him intimately as a person. Each one of us matters to God. Talking about each believer, of course. Cast your cares upon the Lord doesn't mean, I hope we get a 17-pound car. You know, whatever. It doesn't mean that. It means, I can't take it no more. I, it's over. That's what it means. It's a violent word. Jesus couldn't take it anymore, so he overturned the money tables. What do you think he did? He went, <laughs> please, don't speak this way about my father. <laughs> That's how people have you believe. He went over there with a whip that he made himself. Kabang! Get this trash out of here. This is my father's house. He had it up to here. It was this kind of stuff. That's what casting means. Cast your care onto God in that way. One quick thing before my last little thing here. I remember we were sitting on a house. We were going to be in deep debt. And I was at the place with my personal faith where I needed help in this way and I took off in my little blue truck at the time and I have tears in my eyes I've never done this before or since I've come close a few times since but never quite to that extent talk about casting I'm going down 65 and I'm pounding my hand on the dash God if you don't set us free from this we're going to be in deep trouble and I can't take it it was just a financial thing substantial you know quarter million dollar house that we didn't have any money for. And that weekend you send somebody saying, I'd like to buy your house. Somebody could say, well, that person would have come around anyway. I don't believe that. <laughs> they could have come a week ago before I did this, but they didn't. They came when I did this. They came when I casted this. They came when I, and, and I knew right away this was good. Mm -hmm. I, I knew right away this was good. Jill, I think, had a good feeling about it too. And, of course, she did her own praying, etc. And he set us free many times like that. But that's part of the casting. That's why I really brought that up. It was serious. I was pounding my dash, crying to God with tears in my eyes. Get rid of this for me! Because I can't do it. I can't force a buyer, much less to cough up a quarter million dollars. What a wonderful fact of life. The born-again person has the very creator of everything actually living in them to aid in any way that is making sure to bring them to glorification. That's what it's all about. It's not about for you to get this or that or for us to sell that house. It was about to help my faith in him that he would help me in that meaning a little thing that I couldn't handle. I'd treat it like it was the whole world. But it helped me build my trust and faith in him and all of that helps towards keep on running, finishing my particular race. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. So anyone who does this, you'll get there as well. And what a great and awesome God we serve. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so very much for being the one and only true God, for being love for being just, for being full of mercy, which is renewed every day, by the way, for all of us. You never run out of mercy, therefore we never run out of mercy to take as you give it. Hallelujah. And you say, freely take. Help us all to repent, Lord, of anything that needs to be repented of in our personal lives. Help us witness with our lives, not just with our words, but with our very conduct for you. And forgive us all our sins. Be with the persecuted church as always. Protect them. Free them. Hide them. Do whatever you got to do according to your will. In the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we pray you come today, if at all possible. Let the fullness of the Gentiles be complete. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.